This week, uh, this week we're going to continue looking at uh, what God's Word says about how we can be the difference in our world. And I think about our conversations yesterday, Dave, and how we, we come up short with things to say. We're going to look at the, the test of need, of being in a place where you don't have what you need to do what you know you need to do. And the story we look at this morning in John chapter 6 uh, begins with a conversation. It's a conversation we've all had at one time or another. Faced with too many mouths to feed and no food in the cupboard, what do you say? You ever have a situation where your kid comes bursting through the back door and informs you that he invited everybody in the backyard, which means everybody in the neighborhood to stay for supper, and you had it all figured out, you know, you were like down to the end of the, of the weekly budget and you were waiting for the paycheck so you could go back to the grocery store and all of a sudden your generous, wonderful little son or little daughter has just uh, decided to feed the world. And what do you say? What do you do? You know, you go running for those boxes of Kraft's mac and cheese, right? And you're just dumping them all into a big pot. But on this particular situation, Jesus turned to one of the local boys and asked a question. And we see in John chapter 6, verse 5, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? But hidden in that question was something else that was going on. It was actually a test. John tells us in the next verse, verse 6, he asked this only to test him. He asked this only to test him. For he already had in mind what he was going to do. The test Jesus is presenting to Philip could be thought of as the test of need. How would Philip respond to the neediness of the people in this old and broken world? Where would he go to try to meet that need? How would he respond? And most of all, where would he go? Jesus' question was, where shall we buy food for all of these people? Now, this test was filled with echoes of that ancient Exodus story. Number one, like Moses leading the people of Israel to the far shore of the Red Sea, John tells us that Jesus and his disciples had just crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee, of course, wasn't uh, made of salt water. It wasn't part of the ocean. It was a lake. But they called it a sea, and it stood for that place of that, that barrier and that place of chaos that could be so unpredictable. And Jesus had just crossed the sea. And so there's the first little Moses, a little Exodus uh, echo. And the second one is that a huge crowd followed Jesus because, John tells us, because of the signs he had been performing. Jesus had been liberating people from the kingdom of evil just as Moses had performed signs to liberate Israel from the power of Egypt and Pharaoh. The third little connection is that Jesus went up on a mountain, on a mountainside, and he sat there, which was the posture of teaching in those days, just like Moses had delivered God's word from Mount Sinai. And then the fourth one we find in verse 4, when John tells us that this was all happening at a time when the Jewish Passover was near. Passover was, of course, the Jewish feast that celebrated the liberation of the Israelites from the slavery in Egypt. It was their, their Independence Day, their 4th of July. And now, like Moses, out there in the desert with all of these newly freed people, Jesus finds that he has a whole lot of hungry mouths to feed. They're far from any town or any, any village. There is no food to be had. They're in their own little desert. This is a new exodus moment. And so Jesus puts the test to Philip to see how he would meet the need. Now, Philip is a very practical and down-to-earth person. We read in verse 7, Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Can you see Philip going, one, two, three, four, five, 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 five. he's got his little, whatever they had for a calculator going in those days. Uh, maybe he had little beads he could move around or something. And he does the calculation and he goes, buy bread, where? How much? And he runs a quick, he runs the, runs the numbers and he goes, well, 200 days worth of wages wouldn't even give anybody more than a scrap. And Andrew, 
Peter's brother, who's also from the same nearby town, he overhears the conversation and he jumps in, adding to the sense of impossibility. In verse 9, he says, well, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Little tiny lunch. Great big crowd that we're going to learn was over 5,000 people. So how'd they do with the test? Philip and, of course, Andrew jumps into the test. How'd they do? Did they pass or did they fail? Well, from this world's perspective, Philip and Andrew were absolutely correct. They sized up the situation. They didn't just go popping off with some grandiose idea. And they actually counted the people or at least estimated the crowd. And they, they looked in their wallets and they, they did the math and they said, not going to work. You ever been there in your life? <laughs> you look at what you need and you look at what you have and you say, not this month. I was going to pay off that card or I was going to go make a down payment on such and such or we were going to replace that car this month, weren't we? And then you, you go through the numbers and you go, uh, honey, it's not going to happen. And you look at the numbers, you look at the math, you look at the cupboard, you look at the checkbook, uh, you look at the time that you don't have. Think about where in your life you're facing that test of need. And the bottom line is that we come to places where in this old world's economy, we can't make it happen. So in that sense, Philip and Andrew were right on. But from God's perspective, they had totally missed the point. They'd answered Jesus' question of where to get bread by focusing on what instead of focusing on who. Keep that in mind because we're going to see this all the way through this story. They answered the question correctly in terms of what was needed and in terms of what they had, what kind of resources. They didn't answer the question in terms of who was standing right in front of them. They had no idea who it was that was even asking them the question. As John tells us, he already had in mind what he was going to do. You see the test? Philip, where are we going to go? And there's Jesus standing there. He's the where. He's the place to go. Now, this little test that Jesus gave Philip highlights one more Exodus connection. This time from Moses when he retold the Exodus story in the book of Deuteronomy. If you look at those first five books of the Bible, Genesis gets us started. Exodus is the great story of the journey of liberation. Numbers and Leviticus and Numbers take us on our way. And then Deuteronomy, the last one, retells the whole story where Moses helps us kind of dig in to the deeper things that were going on. And when Moses reminds Israel of the gift of bread or manna in the desert, he gives this explanation. You don't find this in the original Exodus story. You find it in this reflection on the Exodus story. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 and 3. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. You see, that whole thing about being hungry in the desert, of being out there where there were no stores, no markets, and then having God provide that, that miraculous gift of food was a test. It was the test of need the test of manna to teach them to focus on the who instead of the what. In their minds, of course, they were thinking, we're hungry, we need food. Their whole focus was on what they needed to meet an immediate need. But God said, I'm doing something deeper with you here to help you see that, yes, I can meet your need, but you've got to look past the what that you think you need so badly to the who, who cares for you and who is guiding you and who can give you life. 
The test was simply whether they would focus on their physical need or whether they would seek out a trusting and obedient relationship with the God who was bringing them to freedom. Would it be bread alone? Or would it be every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord? And you see, Jesus was doing the same thing with Philip. And Andrew jumped in and got, <laughs> got to take the test as well. Probably the whole the 12 disciples were all standing there. And when it, Aunt Philip was saying, we don't have enough money, they were all going, no, no, we don't. And when Andrew said, this lunch isn't big enough, they were going, no, no, it isn't. They, probably the whole bunch of them were all pulled into this thing. Jesus was testing them, testing Philip the way God had tested Israel. Are you going to focus on the bread or are you going to focus on the person who can give bread and give life? Now, it turns out there was one person in that crowd that day who knew where to go in this moment of need. And of course, it was that little boy who gave his lunch to Jesus. He didn't quibble about the cost of feeding the crowd. He didn't see his lunch as woefully inadequate. Isn't that the amazing thing about kids? They, you know, we look at them and, oh, isn't that cute? Maybe it's more than just cute. Oh, isn't that touching? Isn't that nice? Cute little duffer, he gave his lunch. The other part of your brain's going, what an idiot. He should have just eaten it. But you see, that little kid was living out what Jesus said. Except you receive the kingdom of God as a what? MBA? A PhD? As a little child. You'll never enter into it. And that little kid, instead of looking at the what, instead of climbing a tree and counting all the people and then doing the math about how many, how many shekels it would cost to put at least a handful of crumbs in everybody's hand, instead of looking at his lunch and going, this will never work, he looked away from the what and he looked at the who. He looked at the person that was standing up there. He looked at the person who had healed sick people. He looked at the person who had raised dead people. He looked at the person who had changed water into wine, whether or not he knew that story, that's who was there. He looked at that person who had been teaching God's word to them. And he said, well, I don't know if I can fix this whole thing, but I can give my lunch to this guy. As it turns out, There was far more than enough food for 5,000 people, plus their kids, their wives, that day. Just as the Lord had fed Israel in the desert, Jesus, the Lord, now come as one of us, took that little lunch, gave thanks to his father, and John says he distributed it to the crowd. There's a little picture there of God himself putting food into the hands of his people. Jesus distributed it to the crowd. In the same way that the Lord had distributed that manna so mysteriously to the people every day. Like any good Jewish feast, we're told there were plenty of leftovers. Twelve baskets of, of leftovers. Twelve being the number, of course, of the, of the tribes. Another connection, if you will, with Israel on its journey. So there was one person, at least, who had seen the who that was present and seen that he was far more important than what was needed. You're probably starting to see where I'm going with this. Because you and I face those big, giant questions of what we need. We look at what we need from a relationship. We look at what we need in our checkbook. We look at what we need for our kids. We look at what it's going to take to make uh, a, a child be in a place where he or she can grow up and have a good career or have a, a, a good relationship with a mate. And we look at what we need uh, in, in so many areas. I mean, we live in a world of stuff, don't we? You think about all that stuff in your house, and by now my wife and I have been looking at all this stuff and going, how on earth did all this stuff get here? Do you want to know that the real joke of it is at some point we thought we needed it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. And otherwise, we wouldn't have thrown it away. And of course, those of us of a certain generation still have the mentality that 17 mason jars full of screws are important because why? You never know when you're going to need them. 
I think that came along long before there were Lowe's and Home Depots and yeah. You just never know. So here we are, constantly facing the test of what we need. And please hear me, I am not minimizing what you need. I'm not minimizing what I need. The needs are real. And in some cases they are terrifying, and in some cases they are shaming, and in some cases they just cause us to not sleep all night. They create anxiety and fear. We ha live in a place where we are humbled and we have needs. And then there's this little kid with a little lunch that mom fixed for him, and he points the way to something so totally different. He says, forget what we, what we need. Let's go to the who that we need. I need him more than I need it. Now, there are two tests in this story. The second one comes after the food is prepared. Like the overwhelming need, the abundance of food also produced a test. Think of it as the test of plenty. You see, there's a test that comes when we don't have what we need. Let me tell you a little secret. The harder test is the one that comes after you get what you need. Oh, it's so easy to think. If I just, if I had that Powerball ticket, I would do all the right things with it. Isn't there still one out there somewhere? There's one in Kentucky and there's one somewhere else and we keep waiting for that third person to show up. I just know that, Lord, you could trust me with that. And the Lord says, yep, if I could trust you, you've had it already. But <laughs> The bigger test than the test of need is the test of plenty. So how did this crowd that had just been fed by Jesus the five loaves, the two little fish, turned into a feast for a multitude. How did they handle the test of plenty? Well, listen to what happened. The end of the story, and this is only in John, because John is taking us way deeper into this story than all the other Gospels. John 6, 14, 15. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. That prophet was the prophet like Moses. Believe me, they were making Exodus connections all the way through the story and continue to. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. What's going on here? Well, in Jesus' time, there was an intense expectation that God would raise up a new prophet like Moses to rescue his people from foreign oppression and to lead them to victory. And in fact, when it was all over, Israel would rule the world. Moses had promised that one day God would provide a prophet like Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 18, if you have a chance to read that, you'll find it right there. Moses says, somebody like me is coming along someday. And they were looking for that person in Jesus' day. And when the prophet appeared, he would perform signs, miracles, like those Moses had performed. Miraculous bread, miraculous water, Miraculous uh, food or meat. In fact, the historian Josephus, writing just after the time of Jesus, lists off a whole bunch of these prophets and how they went out to the desert and how they gathered people around and some of them were credited with doing signs, all in the hope that Exodus would happen all over again. No wonder then that the crowd that day saw Jesus as the prophet. He crossed the sea, he climbed the mountain, he fed the crowd. There he was doing things nobody else could do and they thought, this is the guy. The miracle of the bread and the fish sealed the deal. Now all that remained was to make him king and have him lead them to victory. And you see what, that's where they failed their test. Instead of discovering who Jesus actually was, God in human form, they tried to make him into what they wanted. They tried to make him king by force. They didn't even ask his opinion. They didn't even say to him, who are you? They said, we'll decide what you will be. You'll be there for our needs. Now in the Exodus story, again, this happened. And I think John is letting us see that people make this mistake every generation. 
In the Exodus story, Israel had rejected who God was and had reimagined him as what they wanted. And do you know what form they gave him? Golden calf. In fact, when Aaron made the calf and he presents it to the people, he says these words, Here is the Lord your God. Not some pagan deity. This is not the God of some other country. He said, this golden calf, this thing is the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Now, all that time, Moses was up on the mountain conversing with the Lord your God. But they didn't want to find out who God was. They didn't want to listen to his words. They didn't want to trust him. They didn't want to obey him. They didn't want to follow him. They wanted to make him into what they wanted. Now, this crowd's doing the same thing. Exactly the same thing. There they are. They've taken an exodus journey. They're out in the desert. And God is present in human form. Not even in a tent. God is standing right in front of them. God feeds them. He distributes the bread to them. This time it doesn't show up outside of their tents like dew on the ground. He, the, the person, Jesus, breaks the bread and puts it almost in their mouths. And instead of allowing the sign of the bread to help them discover who Jesus is, they try to make him into what they wanted, a political and military king. John tells us that the next day, Jesus and the crowd had a long conversation. It goes on for many, many verses. Very, very confrontational. And in this conversation, Jesus offered them the opportunity to take the test of the bread again, the test of plenty, and come up with the right answer. And that's our chance. That's a chance for you and for me to get it right. This conversation started, as you will now suspect, by revisiting the Exodus story. In John 6, 30 and 31, they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe in you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. This was the crowd saying, Do it again. Make some more bread. Hey, we ate yesterday, but we're hungry today. <laughs> Make some more bread. There it is. What will you do? Focus on the what. What sign? What miracle? What cool thing will you do? They wanted something to see and something to believe in. And Jesus answers by challenging them to think outside the box of what. Verses 32, 33, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, it is not Moses who's given you the bread from heaven, but it's my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. Now we got a riddle going. We talking about bread or are we talking about bread? <laughs> For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Now they're still thinking, okay, well what's that? Well, okay, okay, we're getting somewhere. What's that bread? They say in verse 34, Sir, always give us that bread. And then Jesus solves the riddle, verse 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The bread of life is not a what. It's a who. The bread of life is the person who comes down from heaven, gives his life to the world. One little thing you have to know about this verse. Jesus says, I am it's said in the, the language of John, in which John wrote, in a very emphatic way. Because in the Jewish time, Jewish thought of the time, the words I am stood for the great I am. That was God revealing himself. So basically what you have is, in a sense, he's saying Yahweh, bread of life. But it also means I am bread of life. The I am who created all the worlds is standing in front of you. He is the bread of life. Not a what, but a who, a person. And that's why later in the chapter, Jesus will say in verse 58, this is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Life is filled with tests. Every day you face a test of need. That's why they sell cereal in the morning. We wake up hungry. No matter how well we ate, I, every morning when I get up, 
If I want to go check my online banking, there are no little fairies that put more in. <laughs> Somebody found a way to take some out. <laughs> now that we do the online everything, right? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, Green Mountain Power. Oh, they still have my, my account. <laughs> I forgot they were taking that. Oh, gone. Yeah. Hey, down it goes. Every day we face a test of need. Every day we face a test of plenty. Fact of the matter is, I think we all walked in here. Not everybody does that. We got ourselves dressed, we got in our cars, and we've got plans for the rest of the day, and we're blessed. Every day we're going to be tempted to see things from an earthly perspective. Every day we're going to be tempted to do what Philip did and Andrew did. Focus on the what. The what that fills a need or the what that comes from all this plenty. But when we face on the what, we fail the test. The things of this world will never give us the fullness of life that God has for us. That life can only come from him. Jesus is the bread of life, the food of life, the nutrient of life. In the book of Revelation, Jesus poses the same test to a church that had lost its way. The test of plenty and the test of, of need. It's a church that believed the right things, was very content with itself. You might say it was a test that, it was a church that thought it was facing the test of plenty from an earthly perspective. Things were going well. But Jesus tells that church that actually it's in a desperately needy position. Listen to how he describes that church. Wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked. And you know what the people at church would have said when they heard all those words? Wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked. They would have said, no, we're not. We're not wretched. We're well off. We're not pitiful. We're on top of the world. We're not poor. Our bank accounts are full. We're not blind. We can see perfectly fine. We're not naked. We wear good clothes. We've got things all together. And Jesus says, no, you don't. He says, you have focused on the what, and you need to turn to the who. That's why in Revelation 3.20, Jesus says these words, Here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. I got to thinking as I was getting the sermon together about food and people. Food and family, food and best friends. Whether we're talking about Thanksgiving or... I, I think the Southwicks had a big dinner after you got done with all the deal, right? Did you go to Mimos? Did that happen? Was it about Mimos? No. No. I mean, it was. The boys, it was, for the boys, it was probably about Mimos to some extent, right? They were hungry and it was late. And we get everybody together... And especially when you go to the store and you buy the food and then you look at those special recipes and you put it all together and uh, you know how it is, say Thanksgiving or Christmas or Easter maybe you're going to be having a big, uh, big dinner getting everybody together. And uh, maybe you put in two, three days of fixing the food and getting everything ready. You set the table so it's just right and you have everybody's place all set and as you're setting that table you're imagining those people being there. Maybe the family's gathering around and then we all get to the table and all the food comes out and everybody's excited and we're passing this and we're passing that and, and uh, we still got all those pies to eat when this is all over, you know. And we're, we're trying to figure out how to leave enough room somewhere so that we can taste a little bit of each of those. Is it about the food? Listen, if it was about the food, we should have just gone to a restaurant. Thank you very much. But what was going on in the heart of that person who cooked all that food and prepared all of that? What was he or she imagining? What made it all worthwhile? What made it worthwhile was what Jesus talks about when he comes in to sit down and have a meal with us. Being with each other. Focusing on the who, not the what. The food is valuable because it gives us a chance to go beyond the food. Families, marriages, and extended families... Do not live by food alone. 
but by caring for each other, by entering into each other's worlds, by telling stories, by listening, by laughing, by crying, by processing. That's what you guys did, even with those extra boys you got. They're nice guys, by the way. Yeah. And I know in your mind there were three other people that were at the table but couldn't be there going through a hard time. You see, when Jesus offers himself as bread, he is saying, yes, I know that you need, you have needs. I know what you need. But don't ever let the what stop you from moving on to the who. I'm the bread of life. I look back on, oh, for instance, Thanksgiving dinners. Back when my dad was alive, that was his favorite thing. Believe it or not, we go over to Lake George in November. Thank you very much. <laughs> on an unheated camp, we build fires and fireplace. We get the fireplace going and get it up to probably the high 50s, maybe. And the camp was small, and we'd get the table all out and we'd cook forever and ever and ever, and then pack into this place. I mean, you basically couldn't turn around once you got in your seat. I do not remember anything we ate. It had to have been turkey, but that's all I remember. Probably some of those little onions, too. <laughs> I remember mom, dad, brothers, sisters, Suzanne, Grant, my children. I remember people. Because that's all that matters. Who always trumps what? And Jesus says, you don't live by bread alone, but by your relationship with him, the one who gives you life. So isn't that what it means to discover the bread of life? All you have to do is open the door. Here's the good news. You don't even have to cook. He brings the bread because he is the bread of life.